This is the Read to Lead podcast, episode 360. My publisher insisted that every chapter of the book start out with a personal story about what it had been like for me to be a working mom and a hard-driving journalist. That meant I had to essentially open the kimono and admit some of my shortcomings. Hello to you. My name is Jeff Brown, and you have found the Read to Lead podcast, a show I created to help you glean the key insights and main ideas from today's business books, as well as helping you in deciding which books you should be paying attention to. We cover topics as varied as personal and professional development, leadership, productivity, career, marketing, sales, entrepreneurship, and a lot more. And today that a lot more includes a chat with Joanne Lublin. We're going to talk about her brand new book called Power Moms, How Executive Mothers Navigate Work and Life. Now, whether or not you're a mom who needs to navigate work and life, chances are there's one you care about in your life. So if nothing else, listen with that mother in mind. And I should also also note that Joanne covers plenty of ground that's useful and informative regardless of your station in life. I'll ask her why she believes in what she calls work-life sway over work-life balance, examples of companies who have stepped up with regard to working moms and dads, not-so-obvious parenting skills that can be an asset to leaders, and lots more. After eight years of interviewing some of the world's most successful and inspiring authors, I finally got around to writing a book co-authored with my friend Jesse Wisniewski, and I really hope you'll consider picking it up. You can actually pre-order it right now on Amazon. Just go to readtoleadpodcast.com slash book or search read to lead at amazon.com. One of the endorsements we received from the book comes from four-time Read to Lead podcast guest and soon-to-be fifth time podcast guest John Acuff, who says, I might be biased because I'm a writer, but I think books are the cheapest, easiest way to radically change your life. In this book, Jeff and Jesse take that idea and supercharge it with actionable steps you can begin using to improve your career instantly. Jesse and I feel strongly about this book's ability to do just that. So thank you, John, for affirming that for us. We appreciate that. Again, if you'd like to pre-order the book, you can do so right now. Go to Amazon.com and search Read to Lead or be taken to it instantly when you go to readtoleadpodcast.com slash book. The book, by the way, is called Read to Lead, the simple habit that expands your influence and boosts your career. Joanne Lublin is the former management news editor for the Wall Street Journal. She also was its career advice columnist for nearly 30 years and shared the journal's 2003 Pulitzer Prize for stories about corporate scandals. She won the 2018 Lifetime Achievement Award from the Gerald Loeb Awards, the highest honor in business journalism. Her last book is called Earning It, Hard-Won Lessons from Trailblazing Women at the Top of the Business World. And her latest book, and the one we're diving into today, is called Power Moms. How Executive Mothers Navigate Work and Life. It's an honor and a thrill to have such a prestigious journalist on the show. Uh, Joanne, welcome to the Read to Lead podcast. Thank you, Jeff, for having me. Well, let's, let's dive in by talking about some of the work that went into writing this book. You interviewed a lot of women. In fact, a couple of generations of women for this book. Describe a bit about that process that you went through. So the book reflects interviews with 111 women, more than twice as many as I interviewed for my first book. Mm. And of those 111, 86 are women who became business executives and also had children. And those represent two different generations. Mm. The baby boomers, my generation, the first wave of women to get into executive roles at businesses in the U.S. and also have children. And then what I call the Gen Xers, who are about two thirds of them are Gen Xers, one third are millennials. Essentially, they had to be 44 years old or younger when I started my interviews. So they range in age from early 30s to early 40s. The boomers ranged in age from 50s to to late 60s. And then the third group of women were 25 adult daughters of the boomers. What was it like growing up having essentially a super high-powered executive as mom? Mm. Did they want to be just like her? Did they want to be something different? And to what extent, especially those who were daughters of these women who became CEOs, 
did those moms become their informal but rather effective career coaches when mm. they entered the workforce? Well, uh, you yourself, you mentioned we were a part of that first wave of power moms. What was it like for you, Joanne, being a, a pregnant woman in the newsroom back in the day? Well, let's step back a minute. So I joined the Wall Street Journal in 1971, straight out of grad school mm. in the San Francisco Bureau. I had been a summer intern in the Journal's Washington Bureau. In the San Francisco Bureau, I was the first woman hired as a full-time reporter. I later found out that during World War II, when the guys all went off to war, there were receptionists and secretaries in several bureaus at the Journal who got roped into doing some reporting tasks. Uh, of course, they were all women. And then when the war ended and the men came back to their jobs, the women went back to doing non-journalistic pursuits. At the point when I announced my pregnancy with my first child, my son Dan, this was early 1979. It was, as far as I knew, virtually unprecedented mm. for women in the news department, not only to have children, but to come back. And so within a two-week period in early 1979, no fewer than a half a dozen women in the news department announced that they were pregnant. The managing editor went absolutely nuts, <laughs> saying, this is not a job description. What the heck am I supposed to do now? <laughs> but what was difficult is only two of us returned to work of mm. those six after we became moms, and mm. one of them did not stay very long. So... There I am in the Washington Bureau of the Wall Street Journal. As far as I know, I am the only new mother in the news department. I felt completely isolated, alone, unsupported. And frankly, in reporting the book, I discovered that was the biggest burden that that first wave of power moms had to deal with. Mm. The feeling that they were unique, but also somehow strange. And they had to prove themselves time and time again. Mm about being working moms. My first day back at work, when I was waiting for the bus to go home, there was a journal colleague standing alongside me, a guy, of course. And his comment to me was, so where do you park your baby all day? Incredible. Well, talk a bit about the, the shift that you identified between the two waves of power moms you interviewed, Joanne. Uh, what are some of the things that have, have changed for the second wave? Well, the second wave, these women who are the millennials and Gen Xers, Luckily for them, they got to reap the benefits of the first wave. Mm. The first wave mightily struggled to earn it. And the second wave entered the workforce believing that they had earned it. They had earned mm. the right to not only be ambitious women in the workplace, but they had earned the right to be successful parents as well. And they got there partly because they now have role models and mentors at the senior levels mm. among women who have essentially trailblazed ahead of them and also had kids. But at the same time, they were able to take advantage of technological changes. How would we have all been working from home during the pandemic during the past year if it weren't for improvements in technology? Mm. They also had much more support of employers and the third leg, which is perhaps the most critical, is highly involved spouses. Mm. These younger women, for the most part, would not marry or live in a long-term relationship with a significant other who is not equally committed to supporting her career as well as to co-parenting. That was very different than the experience that the many of the boomer moms had. Now, now you were one of the, the exception, I think, to that rule in, in the sense that you had a supportive parent and your husband, Mike, who, who's also a journalist. What was is it fair to say that process was aided at all by the by the contract you wrote before you guys got married? Yes, I think it definitely was, because it kind of set the ground rules for how we were going to enter this long-term relationship. We drew up a marriage contract because, as a journalist, I wanted to know what was I getting myself into <laughs> by giving up my single status. And I read up on the fact that during the suffragist movement in the 1800s, uh, some of the leaders of that movement actually had drafted um, these marriage contracts. And at that point, I was already a member of the National Organization of Women. And so I found out who the local chapter's legal counsel was. 
we were living in San Francisco because I was working for the journal, of course, and asked her if she would draw up a marriage contract. And I wanted to make sure in that marriage contract that several key issues were covered. One was that Mike would accept my desire to keep my name mm. after we got married, which had become a sticking point when we got engaged. <laughs> he, in turn, wanted me to commit to, if we had children, that the children would have his last name. We were both journalists. I knew we were both ambitious and wanted to pursue careers. So we put in that contract that we would alternate whose career took priority mm in terms of deciding where we lived. So because we're the same age, but a year apart in school, I had skipped a grade, he came out to California to join me. And so I knew at some point he would want to, for his career, move somewhere else. Mm. And so we did. But the last part of the, the marriage contract, which frankly is the one I think has done the most good for our marriage, was the only sentence that did not get put into legalese by that lawyer. And that was a sentence that Mike wrote. And the sentence was, household duties shall be shared equally, but not necessarily cheerfully. <laughs> I love that. Appreciate the honesty. Uh, well, you mentioned the pandemic a moment ago. And of course, that hasn't made any of this any easier with work and home and, and school and everything kind of clashing and overlapping more than ever. Uh, there were a few of the uh, Gen X moms you talked to who were already working remotely when the pandemic hit. What are, what are some of the strategies they use that might help moms today who have less experience with remote work? I'll give you two really good examples. And in both cases, uh, after the manuscript was completed last summer, I, I went back to a couple of those and just tried to sort of update their situation mm. kind of since the pandemic had happened. Um, I actually finished the original version of the manuscript just as the entire world shut down, which was kind of disappointing to me because I had been a hermit for nine months writing it. But <laughs> so be it. In any case, one of those Gen X executives, she and her husband are both first-time entrepreneurs. They had both previously worked for a much larger company. And when the pandemic forced them to both work from home with their two little kids, they created an Excel spreadsheet that would keep track of their work commitments and also keep track of who is going to do what in terms of parental tasks for every day of the week between mm. 7 a.m. and 8 p.m., whether it was who was going to make the kids lunch, who was going to do bath time. And then what they did is they allocated three-hour shifts alternating with each other for schooling their first-grade daughter and their pre-K son uh, over the school Zoom calls. Mm. But more importantly than having this weekly spreadsheet they realized that they couldn't be kind of locked in the stone because, as we know, life intrudes. Mm. So every night they would, before bedtime and giving up to total exhaustion, of course, <laughs> they would update, if needed be, the weekly plan. A second Gen X mom had spent four years working remotely mm. and leading a 40-member team before the pandemic hit, mostly over conference calls. She had to adapt to constant video sessions, but this idea of essentially being able to stay connected and to lead from a distance was not new to her. Mm. And so she had two suggestions that I think are very useful. One was that you have to keep networking internally. You have to keep building those connections with your colleagues, mm. even if it's over a virtual coffee, which obviously she got pretty used to because <laughs> she wasn't in the physical headquarters of her employer very often. But the other thing she mentioned, which I hadn't heard about, is that there are special non-prescription glasses you can buy that will block the blue light from mm. that computer screen you're looking at 12 hours a day, and you won't get so many headaches. Mm, boy, I need a pair of those, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joanne, talk about what you call work-life sway. How does that concept differ from what we traditionally understand as work-life balance? Thanks. That's a really good question. In fact, it was the original subtitle of my book, but the publisher said no one will have any idea what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, so we changed the subtitle. And she was right. I had never heard of this concept until I started interviewing the Gen X moms and, and one brought it up. Mm. And the idea here is there's no such thing as work-life balance. It, it is a yoga pose that can never be achieved. <laughs> 
And frankly, if we keep browbeating ourselves, men and women alike, about trying to achieve work-life balance, we're just going to give ourselves more guilt than we frankly need. Mm. Work-life sway, that idea, is that our lives are fluid. And so there are moments when we have to be 110% focused on a work task. And then there are other times when we have to be 110% focused on a task that has to do with our responsibilities as a parent. Now, obviously, when we're isolated and stuck at home with young kids during the pandemic, it makes it very hard to set any boundaries between work and life. And frankly, it's in situations like those where we need to be trying to get help from other sources. I've already spoken about the importance of having a supportive spouse, but I think there are other sources. There was a Gen X power mom who now gives her teenage daughter a small stipend for one or two hours a day to supervise the remote learning for the younger daughter. Mm. Another thing you could think about doing is involving distant grandparents in entertaining your children virtually. In my own case, we've got three grandchildren who live in Minnesota and we live in Pennsylvania. I started a weekly book club months ago with my nine-year-old granddaughter. And frankly, it's been a really, really special bonding experience. We've so far read about a dozen books. We started out with Anna Green Gables. But it's also important to understand in thinking about work-life sway that you may have to sway at any given moment because unexpected events intrude. The Mm. water heater overflows, the power goes off. The whole concept here is to go with the flow, accept the fact that we do not stop being parents when we start working, and we don't stop being working when we're with our family or dealing with other issues on the home front. Now, if you're a parent, you may have dealt with a potential bias from the company you work for toward your attention being quote unquote divided. But the reality is, Joanne says that uh, parenting skills are an asset to leaders. Which skills in particular, Joanne, would you say translate well? Well, I think every time starved parent on the planet knows that they have become very adept at setting priorities well, at delegating, and they also recognize, and workplaces recognize, that those are valued leadership assets. Mm. But there are three other skills that I want to talk about that become especially helpful when parents become managers, because parents have already developed them in having kids. Mm. The first one is empathy. When you become a parent, you learn quite quickly how to walk in little kids' shoes <laughs> and understand what's behind that temper tantrum. That's very translatable to work because unless you understand the people who are working for you and what's going on in their lives and their heads, you're not going to be able to direct them and you're not going to be able to inspire them. And in being truly empathetic, that means you have to be a very good listener and every parent knows mm. that a big part of empathy is listening. The second trait is patience. I think it's particularly hard when you're a high-achieving professional, the way I was, to become a patient parent. Mm. But because you learn that, in turn, you become a pretty patient manager. Mm. And you know, because you've had kids, that you cannot become impatient with somebody who's simply less experienced or even less competent than you are. Mm. And then the third trait is the one that I think I mastered the most from parenthood. I don't think I became super patient or super empathetic, at least right away when I became a boss. But the third parenting skill that is translatable is the ability to mentor. Mm. In becoming a mother before I became a boss, I gained a critical understanding of how to mentor both my children. And I couldn't believe how much my Wall Street Journal colleagues appreciated my ability to effectively mentor them. The joke around the journal was that if you sat near Joanne Lublin, (laughs) you learn more about practicing journalism from overhearing her calls and hearing her feedback afterwards than you did from getting your journalism degree. I think that's a slight (laughs) exaggeration, but that's what we're talking about. I love it. Uh, By the way, other than my local newspaper for a time, the Wall Street Journal is the only newspaper I've ever subscribed to in my entire life. Wow. So you've read some of my stories. I've read some of your stories. Indeed. Indeed. (laughs) Well, let's let's turn our attention to employers. And we're talking a little bit about that already. But uh, what role can they play in helping solve some of these issues and, and maybe even some examples of companies that you feel are beginning to step up? 
Well, I think it's important to look at that question through the the lens of where we are at this point in time. Mm. We have not yet all gone back to work. It's not clear how soon that is going to happen or whether even when it happens, everyone will choose to go back to working Mm. in offices. There have been a number of studies that have suggested not only do parents and other employees enjoy working from home, but employers realize that it is an effective and productive work arrangement. And so they're willing to continue it either part of the week or in significant percentage for full-time basis. Mm. So I think employers can do three things uh, to deal with the issues of working parents and particularly working parents in a post-pandemic world. Number one is to practice smart leadership and offer maximum flexibility as the offices start to reopen. There will be employees, particularly those with young children who want to continue working from home, Mm. trust those employees that they can get the work done at whatever hour best suits them. Mm, I like that. The second thing that employers ought to do is offer generous paid family leave, especially since we have this amended U.S. law that is not as generous as the one that expired in December. That one mandated paid family leave for people who had childcare issues arising from the pandemic. The new amendment, which expires, by the way, very soon, only offers tax credits. And the third thing that employers could do is try and be creative with your other benefits that would enrich or retain the lives and the careers of those working parents. Make sure that that backup child care benefit, for instance, is generous enough to make a difference. Another idea would be to end most of your normal work days in the middle of the afternoon, which is usually what time school ends, whether mm. you're educating your kid from home or the kid is back in school. In terms of your other question about companies that I think are pay setters, I'm going to tell you about two that I talk about in the book. And and both of these companies not only were pay setters in helping working parents work, Mm. but they've proven their commitment again since the pandemic. The first one is American Express. They make a really big deal about the importance of men taking new parenthood seriously. Mm. They encourage them to take their 20 weeks of paid leave when they become parents and not to check in every day during their (laughs) leave. I can't tell you how many stories I've heard of men on paternity leave, including my son, who don't essentially actually detach from work. Mm. American Express offers frontline bosses temporary replacement allowances so they can fill the gaps caused by parental leave and not stir up resentment among people who are not parents or whose children are grown. Another thing they do is they have a 24-7 new parent concierge. You can start using that new parent concierge before you become a parent and for an unlimited time after you return to work. Mm. But the most important thing that American Express does is that the high-level men set an example. The company hosts sessions where new and expectant fathers hear from senior-level male executives whose careers have flourished because essentially they have embraced the cultural norm at that company for working parenthood. And that's what's important here. That's how we're going to change the unconscious bias that persists. We have to change what is expected behavior on the job and what gets rewarded. The other company is Price Waterhouse Coopers or PwC, mm-hmm. which years ago was a pay setter in parent friendly practices. In 2008, for instance, they created a mentor moms program. They would pair expectant and new mothers with more senior internal counterparts, women who had already come back to work and had had children. And then a decade ago, they exempted new mothers and anyone else who had stopped work for at least 16 weeks, because a lot of people do that for other issues. Mm. But they said, if you took a break of at least 16 weeks away from work, you will not be measured for your annual performance review against the peers who stayed on the job Mm. in the year in which you took the lead. And guess what? Their retention rate for returning mothers went up. And as an example of what PwC has done since the pandemic hit, last summer they offered a six-month leave at 20% pay that would run through the end of this March. Mm. Well, much of the book, Joanne, of course, focused on power moms and the raising of their daughters, but but you've got some thoughts on raising sons too. 
Well, as the mother of both a daughter and a son, I have very strong opinions about <laughs> the importance of this. The unconscious bias that we were just talking about is something that will not go away mm. unless fathers and mothers raise feminist sons and daughters. And the way to do that is for both parents to set a strong example in the home that women have to be treated fairly, equally, and not denied opportunities to advance. And to do that, both parents have to be role models in terms of who does what when it comes to household tasks and parenting tasks. So when my son Dan was a little boy, I thought Mike and I were doing a pretty good job. And in particular, I thought I was doing a great job <laughs> in setting that example. But it turned out I was mistaken. And when he was about four years old, his grandfather and my father came over to visit. And Dan saw his grandfather giving his infant sister, Abra, a bottle. And he got very upset. And I couldn't understand why. And I said, what's going on? And Dan said, well, Papa, which is what he called his grandfather, can't give the baby milk. He doesn't have breasts. <laughs> so as far as Dan was concerned, mothers were the only source of nutrition for babies because I was nursing. Mm. And so you need to use those aha moments like that in which essentially your children are absorbing outdated stereotypes to educate them. You can also teach boys how to care for their younger siblings when they're old enough to do so, how to wash their own clothes, how to prepare meals. And frankly, it pays dividends when they become parents. Dan is now a very, very committed and incredibly involved father who took paternity leave with two of his three children. And he would have done it thrice, but when his nine-year-old was born, it wasn't an option. Mm, great examples. Love that. Well, uh, I do want to take time to ask you a couple of questions that aren't directly related to the book. Before I do that, anything else you want to touch on that, that maybe I missed? Well, I want people to understand that one of the reasons they're hearing a lot of stories about me is that my publisher insisted that every chapter of the book start out with a personal story mm. about what it had been like for me to be a working mom and a hard-driving journalist. And so that meant I had to essentially open the kimono and admit some of my shortcomings, mm. which are many, because... Guess what? None of us is perfect as a person and none of us is perfect as a parent. But in the process of doing that, I think I grew closer to my daughter, especially. Uh, and she inspired me to add a chapter called Power Over Pain. Well, uh, give us a bit of insight, Joanne, if you would, into your history with reading and the impact that books have had on your life. How has the habit of reading consistently and with intention played a role in your success, would you say? It's been absolutely critical. Just like my nine-year-old granddaughter is reading books long after her parents think the lights have been turned <laughs> off, I did the same thing. I have very vivid memories of that flashlight under the pillow mm -hmm. that I would turn on after my parents thought I was asleep so I could resume reading my book. And it was reading, of course, that inspired me to write. And in fact, when I was a little girl, I had this fantasy that I would grow up and become a great American novelist, mm. and I would use the pen name of Marcy Wayne. Now, where <laughs> do you think that idea came from? Oh, gosh, I, I don't know. Well, I based it on Mark Twain, <laughs> who also used a pen name, as we That's well right. know. That's right. <laughs> Well, uh, is, is there a book or two throughout your career or your adult life uh, that stands out as having been one that's left a lasting impression on you? Maybe this is a book or maybe there's more than one that you go back to on occasion and revisit. I think the books that made the most impression on me were ones I have read as an adolescent mm -hmm. rather than as an adult. Mm -hmm. Um, so is it all right if I answer the question from that? Oh, example? sure. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. So those two books were Look Homeward Angel by Thomas Wolfe mm -hmm. and a book you may not have ever heard from, but is frankly, again, up there with my top two books called Call It Sleep by Henry Roth. Mm. Uh, I also loved Little Women, of course, <laughs> what, what Little Girl Doesn't. And I, I read Little Women aloud to my daughter, you know, a chapter a night w when she was growing up. And, and, and I definitely loved that as well. Mm. Well, what are you looking forward to as you look ahead uh, throughout the rest of the year? What's down the road that uh, has got you excited? 
Well, what really has me excited is that although I'm no longer the career columnist for the Wall Street Journal, which is a, a column I created 27 years ago, I remain a regular contributor. Mm. And I'm focusing on doing profiles of high achieving women, especially women of color, for a feature in the journal called Personal Board of Directors. I've already done uh, six or seven of those, and uh, more are are awaiting publication. And um, two of those seven or eight that have been completed are women that I interviewed who were Gen Xers for Power Moms. Mm, Excellent. Well, uh, the book, again, is called Power Moms, How Executive Mothers Navigate Work and Life. I highly recommend it, whether you're a power mom or you have a power mom you care a great deal about. That would be a a great reason to read this as well. Uh, Her name is Joanne Lublin. Joanne, thank you so much for uh, coming by today and being a part of the Read to Lead podcast. As I said earlier, it's an honor and a privilege to have you here. Well, thank you very much for having me, Jeff. And if anyone decides they would like to order a copy of the book and get a personalized autograph book plate, Mm. simply email me your mailing address and confirmation of the purchase. And you can email me at Joanne Lublin, J-O-A-N-N-L-U-B-L-I-N at gmail.com. I got my autographed book plate again to get yours. Joanne Lublin, J-O-A-N-N-L-U-B-L-I-N at gmail.com. Thanks, Joanne. For a written summary of today's episode and to dig into those links and resources Joanne and I talked about, you can go to readtoleadpodcast.com slash 360 for episode 360. To be one of the first to pre-order my book, currently available only on amazon.com, You can search for it, Read to the Lead at Amazon, or go to readtoleadpodcast.com slash book to pre-order your copy right now. The book is called Read to Lead, The Simple Habit That Expands Your Influence and Boosts Your Career. Next week, our guest is Michael Shine, author of The Hype Handbook, 12 Indispensable Success Secrets from the World's Greatest Propagandists, Self-Promoters, Cult Leaders, Mischief Makers, and Boundary Breakers. In short, it's a book that helps you master the art and science of using shameless propaganda for personal and social good. Again, that's next time on the Read to Lead podcast. Well, that's going to do it for this week. I look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Read.